Good morning and welcome to the second online DC Python meetup hosted by me in 2020. I'm uh, Alex Clark, President and Executive Director of DC Python, the nonprofit organization that hosts the DC Python meetup. I hope everyone's doing okay and surviving the pandemic. Today we have two exciting talks for you, uh, but first I want to talk about DC Python and the DC Python meetup. Looks like COVID is here for uh, another six months or so. Um, DC Python's purchased a Zoom Pro plan. Uh, I need help folks to either donate to help pay for the uh, 150 a year and also to volunteer to be event organizers because I'm picturing that I'll be able to add folks to the uh, is Zoom in the same way that we add uh, event organizers to the meetup. And I think that if, for starters, if we got a buck or two from folks, that would at least get me through the end of the year. Um, and I also scheduled a main monthly meetup for 2021, which will be me showing up the last Saturday of the month, every month, uh, to establish some consistency. And also, Andrew, um, I did, it took me a few weeks, but I did eventually get meetups to fix uh, the, the events that were in 2038. Uh, so that's some good news. Um, it took them a while to fix it. Uh, but, uh, and with that, um, let's see, let me get everybody. Yeah, welcome everybody. And Andrew, uh, go ahead and get started if you like. <coughs> Okay, uh, can you grant me permission to share my screen or do you wanna pull up my slides? I will uh, click on you and give you permission. Okay, thank you. You don't have a, a green share screen at the bottom, Andrew? Uh, I do, but when I click on it, it says host disabled participant. Oh, I found it. I found it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try that again. Yeah. It might be on the part. There we go. Uh, presenter view. Okay, are you seeing a title slide? Yes, we are. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so my talk is going to be fairly short. It's, it's kind of an appetizer before the main talk. And I'm going to talk about uh, some alternatives to meetup.com for organizing groups and managing uh, RSVPs and that sort of thing. Uh, this is something I've currently been looking at and so, and. Alex and I were talking about this at our last DC Python online get together and he thought it was an interesting idea. So uh, why am I thinking about alternatives to Meetup? Uh, I have two reasons. Uh, worries about corporate stability and uh, sort of annoyance at how the Meetup, the website, the product has kind of stagnated. Um, so a bit of history about the Meetup company. It's a pretty old company founded in 2002. Um, so right after the first dot-com crash, and they've been focused on organizing groups for all that time. Um, in 2017, Meetup got acquired by WeWork. Uh, many of us are probably familiar with WeWork. They, they run basically flexible workspaces where you can rent a desk or a conference room for a day or a week or a month. Um, so it's flexible space for startups and remote workers. And so Meetup got acquired during a run of acquisitions. And the idea was basically corporate synergy that, that you could host meetups at WeWork spaces and, and meetup organizers need places to meet. And WeWork has real estate in lots of different cities. So it kind of seemed like a reasonable idea. 
But two years later in 2019, when WeWork was preparing for their IPO, they ran into trouble. Uh, investors reacted to their S1 filing very badly um, because it, it became apparent they were losing more money than expected. And there were some financial arrangements that were kind of dodgy. Um, as part of this, at one point, Meetup proposed a $2 fee for every RSVP to a meeting, and, and users reacted really negatively to that, and Meetup rolled back that, that idea. Uh, in March 2020, Meetup was sold off because WeWork was selling off all the things they acquired, and they were sold to a private investment firm called Alicorp, and it's not known, they haven't said what their plans are for the company. Um, so part of this, and, and this, this, this organizational turbulence probably leads to my second problem, which is that the meetup site feels kind of stagnant. It, it hasn't evolved and doesn't feel like it's maintained very attentively. Um, part of the WeWork turbulence resulted in layoffs where they laid off 25% of the company and that actually focused on their engineering staff. Um, so, for example, uh, here's like the main page for, you know, the meeting we're in. And it looks like your standard modern website with lots of white space. And if you click through like about and events and members, you know, that all sort of looks the same. But then when you get to photos, it looks like this, which longtime meetup users will recognize as like their second generation redesign. And some of the pieces like discussions and mailing lists still use this whole look. My guess is that the engineering team doesn't really have the resources to update these, or they're not enough of a priority to update. But project management also hasn't resolved that, you know, these like sharing photos is useless because we have Instagram now, maybe. Um, but they haven't resolved to do that, maybe because they have a few big meetups who, you know, need these features or use them very heavily. Uh, meetup charges money to organizers. So I run three meetup groups, a, a French language conversation group, a tech meetup, and a book club. And meetup charges around $200 a year to run three meetups. Now, I don't have a problem with paying money for stuff. I, I'm kind of a stickler for, you know, paying for things I use. Um, and there's, you know, the old cliche of, of if a service is free, you're not the customer, you're the, the product. Um, and, but it's annoying to be paying money for like a clunky product. Does someone need to mute? <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alex, can you mute him? Yeah, hang on one second. Okay. So uh, there's also that three meetup limit, which kind of reduces experimentation. I have three meetups. I don't want to give any of them up at the moment, but I can't start a new one unless I buy the meetup pro level and pricing for that is not on the website. So I went out looking for alternatives. What else is there? Um, so one very obvious choice is Facebook events. S speaking of, of you're the product, not the consumer. Um, so Facebook has an events feature that's hiding under you know, the left-hand menu. Um, advantages of it are first it, that it's completely free, although I'm sure Facebook will encourage you to buy ads to promote your group or your events. Uh, it integrates with Facebook pretty completely. So it's good for people who do a lot of their socializing and, and you know, planning there. Uh, and Facebook has like a wide variety of, of features you can use. You can have like a group or a page. Uh, Facebook has like uh, video streaming and video chat features and, and messenger rooms. And there's lots of stuff there for, for you to use. And it also has obviously the biggest installed base. Um, part of what Meetup does is helping you organize a group and manage RSVPs. Also part of what they do is they help you find new groups and help bring people to your group. And Facebook uh, with you know, their, their recommendations and their wide audience is maybe another good place to do that. 
The downsides are you kind of don't really know what Facebook's algorithm is doing with the group. Uh, when I look at my event recommendations, they really aren't very good. Uh, a lot of them are like for events in New York City, which is not that far from Washington, but I'm not really going to go to New York City for events. Um, and often they're for like music in a genre that I don't actually like. And so maybe I just need to like more stuff or maybe their recommendations aren't that great. Um, and like Meetup, it, it's unclear how much Facebook actually cares about events. Uh, at one point, they wanted to push it very heavily, and there was actually a standalone app for Facebook events in 2016. That app got dropped at some point. Uh, I'm sure Facebook has a lot more money than Meetup does, so they, they probably have a team of engineers like working on maintaining it. But it's unclear, you know, how long this will be. It's unclear like how big a priority it is for them. Uh, the other 800 pound gorilla, Google, I think doesn't have an event service that I could find. They, they used to have one on Google Plus, but Google Plus now is, is like very restricted and largely gone. Um, one alternative I thought of was Eventbrite. Uh, if you've bought tickets to a concert or a movie or a theatrical event, you may have done it on Eventbrite. Um, nice things are that it's free and creating an event is pretty straightforward, but it lacks the idea of a group. So you can look at all events from an organizer, but if I'm running three meetups, that, that sort of stacks my French language conversation, my tech meetup all together, and these are three different audiences. Um, it also sort of leans very heavily on, on the idea of like getting tickets to something and provides an interface to let you manage tickets for your upcoming events, although you can make tickets free. Um, a neither pro nor con feature is that it doesn't have any social features at all. There are no discussions, there are no, uh, you know, chat or mailing list or anything. It's, it's just purely registering for an event. Uh, turning to the open source project side, I found two. Uh, one is called Get Together which is a, a Django app available on GitHub. It seems to be reasonably active. The last commit was in September, which I think is reasonable for an open source project that has you know, like done a 1.0 release and is, is aiming at sort of a specific target. Um, it has the explicit goal of, of being a meetup feature clone. And so the feature is basic, but the design is like reasonably attractive, uh, as you can see this top page here. Um, there's both the Django app and a hosted uh, site at gettogether.community. The actual hosted site has very little activity. It's, it's mostly spam. Um, there are lots of spam events with, with like just a link to some spammy paper writing site. Uh, and I went looking and I have not yet found an event on it with more than one attendee other than the organizer. And so here in this screenshot, you can see the top three events are all my test events that I created for my book club. And the map above shows like, like the nearest events uh, other than that are in like Pittsburgh in Louisville. So, so this isn't very good for discovering new uh, groups, but it's probably fine for like just hosting your own group if you think your attendees you know, can be convinced to sign up for get together. Or if you wanted to host your own instance. So the last thing I'm going to look at is the newest. Uh, Mobilizon is an open source project that just had their 1.0 release on October 27th. And their goal is to provide features similar to Facebook groups. So here you can see uh, for my test group, um, it shows upcoming events. Uh, discussions, a, a very basic web-based discussion forum, a uh, public page for public announcements and things, and resources, which is basically a collection of links, so you can link to additional things. Um, the developers uh, actually have a bunch of innovative ideas. So one of their goals for building the system was supporting political and activist groups, and so that groups like this can stay out of like Facebook's orbit. Um, and so one of their goals, for example, uh, they want to be a tool, not an attraction that like sucks you into exploring randomly. 
um, and they allow or it, group organizers can choose to allow anonymous registrations for events, which can be useful for things like, you know, public demonstrations, that kind of thing. Uh, they also have the idea of you'll have one account, but you can create an infinite number of profiles associated with your account. Uh, many of us, you probably have like a different constellations of meetup groups. You have like your professional groups that are like technical, you have hobbies, you may have political or activist groups. And if you let people, you know, on meetup, you have sort of the choice if you can make your other groups private, or you can just publish all the groups you're in. And that means people in professional circles can sort of see what you do for your hobbies. And so mobile is on provides profiles so you can separate those out. Uh, the other innovative idea is that it's a federated system using a, a W3C recommendation called ActivityPub. Uh, ActivityPub is probably best known for its use in the Mastodon project. Mastodon is basically a decentralized Twitter clone where I sign up for uh, an account on, let's say, free and open source.social but I can still follow accounts or reply to accounts who are hosted on the tabletop.games Mastodon instance. And different instances can sort of choose which other instances they peer with. They can set their own code of conduct or conditions of usage. And you can go out and sort of shop for an instance that sort of meets your requirements. Uh, so because of this federation, there are already 40 or so instances of Mobilizon, although many of them are French language, because this is a, a project that was done by a French development group. They actually ran a Kickstarter in 2019 to get funding for the development process. Um, I think Mobilizon is really neat. The downsides are that it's really new. Remember I said the first release was October 27th, and it, it does need a bit more work. Uh, for example, there's no way to mark a, an event as being online. There's just a location field that has to be a physical location. And this is kind of an odd decision to make for a group organizing site that's launching in October of 2020. Um, and Federation, while it adds a lot of flexibility, also adds complication because you need to choose an instance, um, which is difficult and you're never sure you know, who is hosting this instance and how committed are they to it? Uh, Mastodon has had it, cases where people like started their own instance, got like a couple of thousand users, and then for some reason decided, well, I don't want to do this anymore and, and shut the instance off, sometimes with very short notice. Um, so I was thinking like, like maybe, mass, maybe mobile is on instances should be hosted by like long running organizations that have some level of, of you know, permanence. Uh, like maybe the Python Software Foundation could host an instance because the foundation already covers meetup reg, reg organizer fees for a whole bunch of different groups around the world. And this would be like a free alternative that, that the foundation has more uh, control over. Um, so to wrap up, uh, I haven't come to a conclusion what to do myself yet. I think the two choices are really Facebook and mobile is on. Facebook has the big ecosystem and all the users and lots and lots of tools. And they also have like tools for blocking annoying users and administering things because they've had to develop them. Uh, so a lot of what you need is under Facebook's umbrella. If, you're, if you and your user base are okay with being under Facebook's umbrella and requiring a Facebook login. Uh, mobile is on, I think, is, is really, it's not likely to challenge Meetup any more than Mastodon has, you know, challenged Twitter for user base or, or attention. Um, but there are people, you know, happily working away, you know, communicating away on Mastodon, and I'm sure there will be people organizing their things on mobile is on. Um, I also expect the 1.0 status means people will will find ways to be annoying on Mobilizon and, and they're going to have to build like more complicated blocking and, and administration features. Uh, get together is probably quite suitable if you want to admin the site yourself. 
if you're comfortable like hosting and running a Django app. Uh, I don't know that I would trust the hosted version, gettogether.community, because I don't know how committed they are to keeping it running in future. And I think Eventbrite is sort of a left field idea, but it's not really a solution to the problem of group organizing. It, it would work for like a one-off event and maybe a, a big event. Um, so, but, so that's what I'm coming down on. Um, so thank you for your attention and questions, comments, and are there other group organizing services that I missed? Thank you. Uh... Andrew and I don't know I don't know that you missed any, but I can tell you that um, Google's uh, aggregates them. They don't I don't think they have an event service, but there is uh, pages like this one that I'm about to paste. Uh, and I know this because I'm helping a, a client build an events uh, website that before COVID was location based, and now it is not location-based because everything is virtual. Um, for those that know how to use the raise your hand feature, please raise your hand if you wanna ask Andrew a question. Otherwise I'll keep commenting because I thought that was... Uh, I also have the chat window up. So if you wanna type a question into chat, I'll, I'll see that too. Yeah, good idea. Um, and so my vision for Python events, at least in DC is that we should try you know facebook events we should try other stuff if people are you know interested and inspired to to do that and um you know i think that for practical purposes you know we'll keep using meetup uh if nothing else it's interesting to you know to see to see uh not to look at an accident, you know, not, I don't think it's that bad, but um, just kind of watching it over the years is interesting. Uh, let me find the, okay, instead of raising your hands, just chat. Okay, uh, go ahead, Alex. Hey, Andrew, <clears throat> thanks for that overview. Um... I asked a question in chat, but I think uh, Alex had actually answered it. But I'm I'm just curious for I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Mobilizon. Um, I've I've never seen a link to Google for that event, and so one of the things that I think Meetup is distinctly good at is discoverability. Like if you just randomly Google that stuff, you'll probably find a Meetup. Um, what's what's the solution there like do you already have to be on the platform for mobilizon to discover events or is that just something that we'll have to see this the search query optimization kind of take hold over the next few years yeah i kind of i kind of imagine that's also part of the 1.0ness the the instances are all pretty new and maybe haven't really been noticed yet and that maybe the code needs to be optimized to publish a, you know, a Google site map or whatever, so that the search, the quality of, of search results is improved. So yeah, I think, I think we'll have to see how that shakes out. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, I forgot to mention, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so Mobilizon uh, is written in a language called Elixir. Uh, which apparently runs on top of the Erlang virtual machine. Uh, I think Framasoft, the company which ran its development, has written other things in Elixir, so that kind of seems to be their thing, uh, which I thought was an interesting choice. And it's interesting to, to like page through and look at what their code looks like. Th there is no Riley book on on like learning Elixir, so it's it's reached that level of of popularity. Is there an O'Reilly book on how to use Zoom? <laughs> uh, all right, a couple other items of business that I missed during my intro. One, if you can figure out the clap button, please everyone clap uh, for Rami who has received the PSF uh, Community Service Award for Q4. And yeah, thank you, Andrew, for that talk. Um, two, welcome uh, Jacob a new event organizer. Um, I'm, 
I'm tightening up the event organizers team so that we can, so I can get everyone motivated to do these, uh, you know, these virtual uh, online Zoom for like the next six months or so. I think that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, like PSF, we're a nonprofit and we have sponsors and two notable ones are Tidelift and Hatch. Hatch sort of dropped off with COVID, but I'm sure they're, uh, they'll be back at some point possibly to, or hopefully to organize a Zoom. Um, like I said, I'm gonna sh show up once a month to do these. I, I would encourage everyone to donate and host events. Um, and, oh, and thank you, uh, Steffi and Sam, because you guys came along. Uh, I wish everyone did this. You guys came along and said, hey, can I give a talk? And I said, yes. <laughs> so uh, Sam, your company, and Steffi, your company looks interesting. Uh, please take it away. Um, and thanks for coming. Cool, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Can everyone see this okay? Just give me a little thumbs up maybe. Cool. All right. So yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for having me here. Um, so yeah, my name is Sam. I'm the co-founder of CTO Oso. Um, and basically what I want to talk to talk about in, you know, today is around sort of access controls in Python, uh, access control patterns in Python. And in particular, um, you know, what my company also is doing, trying to make that kind of, you know, that that space easier for developers. And so basically, you know, the, the entire background of, um, you know, the company also and what we're trying to do is around making security as something that's more accessible for developers. Um, we think that it's, you know, a problem that many, many developers would like to be engaged with, but a lot of the tooling is just, is so hard and it's kind of the kind of thing that's hard to get right that it sort of scares people away. Um, let me pull up my chat as well, just in case there are questions. Um, all right, and so a bit of background on myself as well. So um, I've been I've been using Python for a good sort of ten years. It started off um, I have a background in maths and cryptography, and it, and it kind of all started off then uh, using some things around like Sage Math and doing things with elliptic curves. And um, and yeah, I did a I did a PhD in cryptography, and that kind of led me down this route around you know security and how I could try and make things uh, easier to, for developers. So. I'm just going to give a little bit, a little bit of background around access control, and in particular, there are these two, two, two um, common topics around authentication and authorization. So authentication, which is typically, you know, identifying who you are. So in this case, you know, imagine you're logging in with a device, and the authentication piece would be identifying that IP address or that device as, for example, username Sam. So I enter my credentials and I authenticate. The authorization piece would be deciding what, what can Sam do? You know, so Sam can read document number 12, Sam cannot read document number four. You know, so this piece is, you know, this piece on the right is authorization, and that's going to be kind of the main piece that I'll focus on um, in this talk. So to give an example of this in you know, an application that most people might be familiar with, uh, GitHub, the authentication piece again would be where I enter my username or email address and my password, and I authenticate as the user Sam's got 89. The authorization piece is maybe not so visibly obvious. So for example, you know, I try to access these two URLs in GitHub. One is the Teams page for OSOHQ, the organization. The other is the Teams page for Django. So this is where you know, needs to know, okay, who is Sam? What can he do? Um, so yep, it's absolutely happy to let me go and see the OSO Teams because um, I'm a member of that organization. I'm a member of a team there. But you can kind of see in the, on the Django page, right, it says you're not a member of any teams in this organization. So this is one of the, like the, the visible places authorization is happening. but you know, think about the fact that sometimes you go to an organization page, you might not even see a repository because it's not visible to you because you're not authorized to see it. So something else I want to talk about, which is which comes up a lot in this category of authorization is, is roles and role-based access control. Um, I feel like a lot of people might encounter this when they see these giant matrices of permissions. Uh, this is actually an example from GitLab. Um, you know, so they have these five different roles and they kind of have all these tables showing you what these different roles can do. So roles can really be uh, good and bad. Like I kind of have a bit of a love-hate relationship with roles because done well, I think what they do is they give you this sort of 
intuitive categorization of what somebody can do in the application. You know, GitLab, GitHub, they're both very, very complex applications. There's a lot of things you can potentially do. So it makes sense to sort of divide up those permissions by, um, you know, concepts of like a responsibility or a thing you'd expect someone to do. Like take a simple one, you know, owners can do absolutely anything. You know, reporters kind of have something like a re you know, read level access and, and sort of other things in between. Um, so those, those can kind of work quite well. Um, so yeah, so they're good when you have sort of a small number of them. They relate to those like intuitive concepts of responsibilities, like I just said. And the third one, which I think is one which people don't often think about or talk about a lot, is that you achieve granularity by breaking roles and applying them to kind of resources. So, you know, think about, you know, inside something like GitHub, you can be, you know, a member of an organization and you can have a role inside that organization. You, know, you could be the organization owner or a member, and that might say what you can do across like all the repositories. But you can you can go sort of more granular. You can also say, all right, you know, Sam, you know, Sam is a member of the organization, but he's also an admin of this specific repository. And so by doing that, I don't need to introduce like a greater number of roles that sort of somehow captures, you know, this in between organization and repository admin or something like that. I can just say, you know, very finely select, you know, one role for the whole organization and now like another more specific role for like a subunit of that, like a team or a, um, you know, or a repository. So I think, you know, having, having this in mind, you know, achieving this can often be very hard. Um, is one thing and I'll kind of talk about like, you know, some patterns or ways to, to achieve that. Um, but I think, you know, this kind of comes, this is for me like the, the sort of the, the way that you can make these, these work pretty well. And then kind of the flip side of these, right? They don't work well when you have these giant, you know, 50 by hundred matrices of roles and, you know, people can create arbitrary custom roles and, and you just lose track of like what can happen. And that can be hard from an implementation side and a, and a user facing side just to really communicate what's going on. There's another like very, very common topic in, in access control, you know, these two, these two terms, ABAC and RBAC. So RBAC, the thing I just spoke about being this like role-based access control, you, know, you, you assign a user to a role, you give a role a permission, and that's how you decide what they can do. Um, the concept of ABAC is you do something more like uh, based on what you know about the user and the resource. So for example, examples of this might be uh, users can delete their own comments. So you're kind of using an attribute of the user as like the, you know, and the comment in, in some way. Or similarly, you know, organization members can see repositories inside that organization. This, this is kind of ABAC, but it's actually kind of coming back to this sort of similar to roles, like I said before. Th these two things often get like very overlapping. Um, you know, another, like another simple ABAC example might be um, you, you, anybody can see a public repository but not private repositories, right? That's like very much just on an attribute of that repository. You know, can I see it or not? Um, these terms come up a lot and, you know, people talk about, you know, one versus the other, which one's better. But I think going back to what I was just saying on the, if you, if you structure your app with a small number of roles and apply them to resources, I think it actually covers a large, large set of those, these similar use cases. And it's actually a really helpful way to think about, um, in particular, conditions like the second one. Um, you know, organization members can see repositories in that organization. Framing that as, as a role-based system can actually be very, very clean and simple. Okay, so I'm gonna, I wanna do like a small little demo of um, inside a Django application of using OSO. So OSO is an open source policy engine for authorization. And it kind of has two key components. There's the policy language called Polar. And that's what you see at the top, which I'll walk through in a sec. And then there's a uh, library which is available in multiple different languages. Python's one of them. We also support uh, Ruby, Java, Node, and Rust. And the kind of the idea is that the uh, the library in, in you know say the Python library gives this very very simple interface. You say ask OSA the question is is allowed you know is the user allowed to read a repository, and it makes that decision based on the rules you express in the Polar policy language. So that's what I have up top here. So the the policy language, it's a declarative logic-based programming language, but it also has uh, kind of object semantics. So the rule I have up top here is, is an allow rule. I'm, I'm specifying whether a user should be allowed to do something. And it's taking in three inputs, a user, an action, and a repository, the resource. And you can see that I've, I've specified those inputs in a, in a specific way. So I've said the user, and I've typed it as a user object. So it must be a user object, which should be defined by the host by Python. The second input I've just said must be the string read. So only accept arguments where the string is read. It'll do that sort of before matching the rule. 
and the re repository again is typed as a repository. And you can see I've done one of these very, very simple kind of attribute based style checks or um, you know, checking is the user the repository's owner? That's my condition. So um, when I pass in you know, user and a repository to this also is allowed call, uh, it will return true if this condition holds, it will return false otherwise. If I pass in something else that isn't a repository and it's not a user, um, this rule won't even, won't even apply. It won't even try and do this rule because of these type checks. Okay, so uh, I have a little like demo application uh, written in Django. Before I do that though, so uh, Andrew, by the way, thank you for the for previous talk. That was great and interesting. I figured since you since you just you know took us through a bunch of meetup stuff, uh, and I started googling this get together app. So this is the uh, this is the get together community app that Andrew was just talking about written in Django. I was kind of curious because I think events organization is one of those ones that does have some kind of permissions. And so I thought it might be interesting to do a, do a little example based on uh, what we have here. So this is, I may well come back to these questions at the, at the end. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is like, a, this is fairly typical, uh, what you might see in, in a, in a kind of typical application today of how someone might you know typically do authorization so there's a method which is like can create event and you see there's like a bunch of conditions to be to, to hold um so i'm instead going to give an example of what this would look like uh written in the polar policy language i hopefully this will be visible enough at this size okay so for example so it says, so the rules take the format, you have allow rule and it takes in a user an action and a resource. And then you have sort of if and the conditions that follows. So in this case, we're asking can a user, and this would be in, in the case of Django, this user would be um, kind of namespaced by the, the sort of full, full model name. So I'm assuming maybe this is, you know, I'm assuming this is like a, you know, say the Django app name is like events. It would be something like events user. I'm going to have to do this on multiple lines to make this visible. Uh, and the thing we're asking is, can the user create? And the resource in this case is an event. So it'd probably be something like events event. Let's just put those on multiple lines. OK, and then so the if conditions that we're trying to match. So we have multiple here. We're saying uh, if the user is super user return true, uh, if they, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of different things here. So we could say, user dot is super user. And the nice thing is I, so I don't need to try and replicate this sort of nested if else type thing, because this sort of the, the idea of the polar rules is that you can write multiple of them and they all like match individually. So I could equally, um, and you know, for, for a rule like this where I'm checking if they're super user, I, I might not even wanna check the action. I might just say, this is for any action. Super users can do anything. Uh, Next thing I'm saying, maybe the, the I want to check that the team's owner profile. Okay, cool. That, that sounds like the kind of thing we've done. So I want to say the user equals, I'm not sure why this takes a team as an input. So maybe it's like the event team owner profile. So that'd be my other allow rule. I'm saying a user can create an event if they are the team's owner profile, or the owner of the team that the event is in. Um, and similarly, I might have a, a last rule, which says, again, I can allow them if they are in the moderators list. Okay, so like here's an example for this, creating an event in that profile page, right? So, in, you know, I can write these, these three rules to say, you know, super users can do anything. You can create an event if you're the owner of the, the team it's in, or if you're one of the moderators for the team the event's in. Now, this is like a, one rule for that specific method we just created here. But so the, the power of writing things in this like declarative way is that you can sort of extract out common pieces of, of logic and you can write you know, far more general rules than like specifically what each one of these things does. Because look, there's a, you know, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of, of uh, duplication in the kinds of logic. And um, as I said, this, this is nothing against the, you know, the also of this, this is just very, very common way to write things. So, you know, what I might, what I might do instead is, is start breaking this policy up and I'm just gonna full screen this one now. And so for example, I might say, um, 
user in role, I might create a new a new predicate, a new rule to, to capture some of that shared logic. Like a user is a, uh, let's say moderator of a uh, an event. And, and I could say, you know, use these, for example. So they can either be in that moderator's table. Um, I could say they're an owner of an event if they are the, the owner profile. And then I can do some, some nice things here. Like I could, for example, say, well, owners, owners should have all the same permissions as moderators. So why don't I, why don't I do a little, um, little inheritance style pattern here and say, uh, a user can be in the moderator role if they have the owner role already. And now even like anything, uh, anything a moderator can do, an owner can also do. Um, so I don't need to sort of you know repeat myself every time for that. Now that I've written these, you know, I can I can collapse down pretty much all of these things. I can just say, well, I want the user to be um, in the moderator role for this event. Um, so now I don't need this rule. I can. Um, I can even go maybe a bit further and I can say, well, I want to, I want to do this across multiple actions. So let's, let's not just do this for create, but say maybe the action is in, you know, read, create, maybe it's edit and delete, do some sort of crud like thing here. Right. So I can kind of really like build up and structure some of my, my policies this way. Okay. So that's the, that's the policy piece. Um, I'll actually I'll actually pause here. I have, so I have more I have more to go into to show around uh, what this actually would look like uh, from an implementation standpoint in the in the Django app. But I'll kind of pause here for a sec because I know I just kind of covered a lot of a lot of new things, and I kind of want to see if anyone has any questions at this point. Yes, um, I'll start. So you're saying that as a Django developer, I would install Oso and build all kinds of uh, elaborate uh, authorization policies in my app? Yeah, that's right. So, so the idea is that you can express all of your authorization concerns in, the, in these polar policies. And you'd use the OSO library in which you have a specific Django OSO integration that you would use to do um, that you would use to do the actual enforcement inside the application. It will do things like loading the policies and it kind of does the integration piece. And yeah, so what does that, that yeah. look like exactly uh, integrating with, uh, I'm sure lots of things, but Django in particular, uh, what does that in integration layer involve? I imagine, you know, interfacing with Django's security. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so the, I'll, I'll kind of I'll kind of walk through it in a bit. At, at the moment, the the main thing is that we um, the Django integration piece, you know, it it does a lot of the it does some of the setup work for you. So, for example, um, if you put we'll see in a sec like the folder structure, but like if you put a policy file in the right folder, it automatically loads it and reloads it if it changes. So it has that kind of Django integration piece, um, but it also produces some kind of helper methods to do the authorization. You know, inside your views, for example, or um, you know, actually expose things like a Django manager that allows you to filter down to authorize objects. I'll, I'll go like way more into depth on the Django app side in a sec with the with the Django demo. Okay, I have a comment, and then we have a few more questions. My comment is, please, uh, I see that you're, you know, Python is one of um, a half a dozen or so languages you're targeting. I would love to see um, a description <laughs> when you publish the. <laughs> The also uh, packages because it looks like you don't care, you know, about Python. It, so that I think just adding, you know, description a link to to also also GitHub or something would go. Yeah, yeah, anyway, we are. Uh, yes. <laughs> sorry, yeah, thank Python you. No, we, we're here. doing that like this week. It's been, oh, it's been on our, our backlog for too long. Um, Python is probably actually the one which you support the most and put the most support into. Uh, and so, if you go on our, our docs page, it's pretty. You'll see there's a, a ton of documentation around using this. A couple method. questions in the chat, I think, at least. Yeah. So, how do you control conflict in the case of inheritance? Is it less inheritance holding? So, in so this, um, 
I don't fully, I, I, okay, I, I think I somewhat understand. So the, the way, the way the policy logic kind of operates is, um, you know, you can kind of think of each of these rules I've written as an or, and the kind of allow question is basically saying, you know, is there some combination of rules that results in this being allowed? So in the case of, um, so where I've done something like inheritance here, and I've said, you know, owners can do anything moderators can do, then uh, to make this allow rule true, for example, there's a few things that can happen. So first of all, they'll check the actions in this list. Um, so if that passes, it goes to the next condition and says, is the user in the moderator role? And there are two different ways that the user could be a moderator. One is directly they're in the moderators list. And the second is that they inherit it through being an owner and they can be an owner through this like team owner profile. And so basically like the OSO library, uh, the policy engine is kind of doing that, you know, combinate, you know, that um, inference, that logic, that's kind of search algorithm uh, on your behalf, which is why it kind of stays in this flat structure. It's kind of doing the if else navigating through, okay, like are they a moderator? If not, are they owner? If not, then can they do these things? Cool. And then there was a government question that uh, I wasn't sure exactly what the question was, but yeah, let me just uh, do, let me answer this clarification quickly. Yeah, go ahead. You can inherit one role that allows and one that does not allow. Um, I, it it sort of depends. If um, it depends how you structure your like allow and deny. So we we don't um, enforce any particular uh, combination of like allow and allow and deny. So you can you can you can decide to, for example only allow if there does not exist a deny, or you can check deny first. And if, if a deny doesn't exist, don't allow things like that. Um, so it, it kind of depends on how you structure policy. Um, but we, we need better documentation actually on those kind of combinations. Um, so do government agencies requiring, so I think, yeah, maybe just do you have any yeah. government clients? <laughs> <laughs> so we don't currently. Uh, we we've we've spoken to a ton of companies though who um, who do talk, look at this from like a compliance perspective. Uh, FedRAMP in particular is absolutely one that specifies uh, a ton of kind of access control authorization mechanisms. And there's a few there's a few there's a few pieces of that there. There's like the you know the enforcement of authorization. So the stuff that I'm showing now, like do you have authorization in the first place? There is. Uh, kind of like policy change management, which is, you know, can someone make changes to this authorization policy, you know, through some sort of review process? And then auditing is a huge piece of this as well, which is, um, and these are all kind of stuff on our, um, you know, stuff that we've been talking with, with customers around, but more, more on some of the like enterprise offerings we, we've been investigating as opposed to this open source library, um, you know, capturing, capturing these query results and events and doing auditing over them. Okay, cool. I'm gonna so, so I'm gonna launch back into the into the demo. Okay, so for the demo, I have a very bare bones, basic Django expenses app, and uh, actually, I should get rid of this policy because this is the one I'm using for the demo. Cool, and you can see. Okay, right now the app does not do a whole lot. I can't see any expenses, and if I can log in, say as Alice. Um, you can see I can log in as Alice. I have a company and a, and a title, but it still can't see any expenses. And so basically, this is because right now I'm using I'm using Oso in my Django application, but Oso by default is deny all. I don't have a single allow rule, so everything is kind of being denied by default. So I am going to add a thing, add a rule which will just say allow everything, right? So these are basically underscores is like a ignored variable, anonymous variable. So it's just ignores all inputs and just return allow always. Cool, so with this in place, I can kind of see some of the data I've got going. I have expenses, they're categorized, they're assigned to various people, and they all were generated with this amazing uh, hipster random description generator. Cool, so this is, so this is my basic app. The, so the way, that, the way that you'd go and add like Oso, for example, to a Django application, First things first, you add it to your installed apps. So you'd you know, pip install or add to your requirements, Django Oso and add it to your installed apps. 
And as I was mentioning earlier, that'll do like that'll do a bunch of things for you automatically. It will um, make it so that any policy files in your policy directory will be loaded and automatically refreshed. So the reason I could just add that rule, save it, and refresh is because you know that's the Django integration kind of picking that up. Um, and I'll also make the sort of Django types available in policies. So I can write you know things like user must be a um, expenses. So expenses is the name of my of my app. I can say the user must be an expenses user. And what this will do, so Alice can still see everything, but if I log out, because the anonymous user is not a, is not a user, it's basically getting denied for everything. So let me let me let me go and undo that again. So if I get rid of this, I say the user can be anything. Even logged out users can see everything. So this type check here is actually is already enforcing a certain amount of authorization, saying, well, you must at least be logged in. Which is you know a similar thing that you might achieve by gating the entire screen as logged in or not. Um, okay, so that's so that's through the Django SOBs. Okay, so how did I how am I making this you know these these things showing or not showing? And this is kind of the, the main piece of the the integration. So in my um, so I have a few things going on here. So this is my list expenses endpoint. Um, most of this you can see is just kind of like the regular view logic. You know, all of this stuff down here is just grouping my expenses by category, for example. Um, I want this to be pretty efficient. So I added, also I should say, I'm not a Django expert, so this may not be very uh, idiomatic, but I, you know, I want to prefetch a bunch of things. My expenses have owners and categories and organizations. So I, I, want, to, I want to prefetch those to make sure it's, it's nice and quick. This is where the authorization is happening. So I'm doing kind of a, a, a standard like Django style, you know, objects query, but um, we'll see in a sec, this expense, this expense model uh, inherits from a particular you know, Django Oso um, class, which, which gives us this authorized method that allows me to filter down the objects to just those authorized ones. And so the, this method is basically applying uh, this policy to, to all the objects. And so um, let me try and do something more, uh, more interesting and talk about it a little bit more. So let me, let me log back in as Alice. So okay, this is you know I'm I'm seeing a few too many of my expenses. Uh, you know I can see everybody's. So let's say I just want to be able to see my own expenses. Um, so the expense is again expenses expense, and I want the condition to be that the user is equal to the expense owner. And I'll save that. I can flip back. Give it a quick refresh. And and now it's not working. What did I? Oh, I typoed something. Oh, I didn't write if. <laughs> that would help. As it's now crashed everything. Let's try that again. Cool. All right, here we go. Okay, great. So now I can filter everything down to just the ones that Alice has access to. Um, and the nice thing is I can actually, you know, I, I can I can apply you know a number of different conditions here. Uh, the um, oh yeah, and the other thing I so okay, so like organization field is now currently missing, even though I can see these expenses. And going back to my uh, to my to my view page, we can see this because I'm actually I'm prefetching organizations, but I'm passing in again organizations which are filtered down to those that only those I'm authorized to see. So let me go and deal with that first. So let's um, is that another allow rule that says I can? I mean these 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 don't need to be. I'm, I'm I'll just point out quickly. So I, I'm passing as the action read. So this would be the, the second parameter that's coming in here, but I can also just ignore it. Uh, let's say I can see a, an organization if the organization ID matches the one I pass in. Cool, now I have the organization information. So 
Okay, so this is like, you know, so this is the sort of the, the, the main pattern that I was kind of talking about earlier. And, you know, I can build up these rules just like I was sharing with the sort of event style meetup thing to, you know, to gradually build up more and more complicated uh, permissions. The piece I wanted to come back to, um, well, I mean, to, you know, this is kind of the main, the main, the main point of using O. So this is kind of the idea is that you, um, it, you know, it, it gives you this ability to write authorization directly over objects. You can also do authorization directly on the um, directly on object itself instead of doing it over the full collection. Uh, so, for example, you might do that in you know maybe in the save methods. Uh, if you know someone wants to submit a new expense, I might want to make sure you know they're allowed to create an expense. And again, this is going to do on the day that we're creating before the save, things like that. Um, this returns a 403 if it fails. And so, kind of the main idea is now is that like instead of um, or like in, in, you know, instead of having to you know, scatter your authorization logic throughout your code, have you know those if else statements like in your maybe in your view methods and, and coming around and and maybe losing track of exactly where everything's going on. This gives you this ability to sort of apply in a pretty uniform way across like the the whole app. But the logic is kind of nicely encapsulated in these in these policy files. So this is like the main point of the of the Django OS integration. There's also a few other bits and pieces you can read about in the docs around there's like a middleware piece and things like that. But the the final piece I wanted to talk about was to circle back to what I was talking around with the um, ways of thinking about doing roles and how that would look like in, a, in an app like this. So here is my Django models. Um, this is the authorized model thing I'm extending from. I, I mentioned earlier to, to allow me to do that authorized methods. Um, we're thinking about making this something like a mix-in instead. I think it would be probably more idiomatic for Django. Uh, but so I have, you know, so I have a few models in here, like users, organizations, and these categories. So the kind of the, the, the kind of model I wanted to talk about now was like, so imagine I wanted to have um, a new kind of, you know, somewhat more complex version of um, of the policy I have right now. Where like, okay, fine, users can see expenses. Maybe I can say. Um, you know, the CEO can see all the expenses inside the organization and so on and so on. But like, what if I wanted to do some like some more complex things like saying, well, uh, you know, a user can maybe have a role which, you know, grants them access to all expenses inside a category. And you have the like food accounting manager or something who can manage all of those account expenses. So what that would look like from, a, from both like the modeling, you know, data, data format standpoint would be you know, it's effectively a relation between users and those categories. And the kind of way that you'd represent this in, in Django, for example, is through that many meta relationship. So users can kind of belong to categories um, and through, right, and there can be exist, you know, potentially many of them. Like a category can have many users, users can have many categories. And kind of the nice thing you can do in, in Django is like be very explicit around this uh, intermediate table. <clears throat> So when I set up the many-to-many -many field between categories and users, I can say that the, the, the table that actually stores those relations is, is called category member. And what I can do then is actually assign uh, data onto that, onto that table. So for example, if I had a role field on this category member table, and this was a, let's say a char field, um, and we're gonna have this, I'll come back to default. Well, let's say the default is a member or, and it actually has uh, choices for like the different roles you can be. So maybe you have a, a member role, someone is a member of a category, and you have say an admin role. So in some ways this, you know, this is now kind of the data model I think is, is really powerful for, for these kind of role things. I can now say a, a user has a particular role in a particular category, and I can do that in this like very, um, in a very, very granular, very flexible way. So maybe, you know, maybe Alice is a member of the food expenses and an admin of the travel expenses. Someone else can be an admin of just the food expenses and, and so on and so on. And the reason this is so powerful is because you, you can now write your policies directly over this as well. Um, so what this might look like, for example, is, you know, maybe allow a user uh, to read some, you know, expense. Uh, if and we want to check that the user has a particular role, 
uh, maybe they have the uh, admin role for the expense category. And again, you can kind of say a uh, user has the admin role. Actually, we can just say the user has, has a particular role for a category if, um, and this would be, oh, I had this one up. Uh, I think I have an example of this one over here. Right, something like this. User equals category dot members. So, okay, first of all, the user is in the, is in, is effectively in this members list. And we can say the user, uh, I think it would be category member role equals role. So let me, let's see if the, So let's try this. Um, lift first. Yeah. So this would be the this would be the kind of policy that you could write for for enforcing that access. And kind of the nice thing is now like we now have you know through our database dynamically we can find out like the specific role someone has within that category and use that to to write those allow rules over it. And the um, kind of one final piece I want to talk about the. Oh yeah, I didn't do my child field right. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out, so all of the all of the polar policy stuff I was showing you around doing the filtering on that list endpoint. Um, this you can this is like the full trace output up here of the, the of the polar query that's been executed. But this is the kind of piece I wanted to talk about right here. So this is the query that got executed to get back those authorized expenses. And effectively what's happened is those polar policies that we just saw that I wrote are effectively kind of like compiled down into a Django filter. And then, you know, that Django filter thing just gets to operate using the Django RM model. And so it gets to, you know, it's the one that's going to worry about the sort of construction of the actual SQL query. So in this, for example, you can see I'm retrieving all the various fields and look at this where clause down here. It's checking that the owner ID is one, um, which in this case was the only rule I had before. You can see your own policies. So it, because it had the user object, it can get the, you know, it can effectively fill in that owner ID fields. And this will like accumulate them for all those different rules I wrote. So it could be, um, you know, this might do a, a union or a join or something over like, you know, the owner ID is one or the it's in this particular category and, and so on, so on, so on. Um, that's kind of part of the piece of the Django uh, integration is doing there. Um, okay. So that was the main thing I want to talk about. Here are some helpful, docu uh, helpful links about us, which I'm going to paste down in Slack, in the Slack, in the, in the chat. Um, I will point out quickly as well. So the, uh, the docs page, you can see, you know, you can see this is where the, so we have the full Python documentation is, is all in here. Um, along with, this is the stuff that we really need to get in the, in the readme on, on PyPy, but you can see the sort of full, full Python documentation around the different types that works, uh, you know, and, and the various API things. Uh, we've got, for example, a full, full guide on the kind of stuff I was just talking about, like how, how do you structure, you know, roles in a multi-tenant application, right? So maybe if you have users in, in organizations, that kind of thing. Um, role specific role, resource specific roles, as I was just talking about, is this idea of having users being associated to a role in a resource and, and the kind of power of that. So there's, there's a kind of a few different pieces in here that you can, you can check out. All right, well, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I'm happy to take any questions people have. Thank you, Sam. Uh, happy to answer this question from Rami straight away. <laughs> yeah, go right, go right ahead. I, I have a similar question, but let's do that one first. So, okay, so as I, I stated right at the beginning, right, our, our kind of mission is around um, making security more accessible for developers. And for that, we feel like the 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 way to make that happen is through an open source library for authorization because we just felt like that was the right way to do authorization in an app. Um, the sort of the way that it's coupled with like application data, the stuff I was showing, writing policies over those models, it can only really be done, be done by a library. And to me, if you're going to embed a library in your application for something like authorization, it sort of has to be open source. It's just the the right choice for developers. So that's kind of why we made those choices around open source. Um, 
the way we make money as a company, um, well, a couple of things. So we're we're venture backed, and you know our you know our, our VC partners are very um, supportive with us in you know basically driving the open source adoption of this core product. In the longer term, the kind of stuff that we monetize will be uh, features that you need for you know managing this across larger organizations or doing you know specific security features. So when I spoke earlier around things like auditing, that would be something that would be in like a managed OSA service um, that would be an enterprise thing. So like everything you see here today, fully open source and will continue to be. Everything that you need as a developer to get running with OSO, um, that's always going to be open source and it'll be available as a library. It's when you want to maybe you know coordinate multiple instances of these across a large organization. You want to do things like um, have control over who can modify policies and yeah, have auditing around like you know requests that have been made that um, would be a standalone service separate from the open source thing that which is what we charge for. But um, yeah, fun fundamentally though, we, you know, the reason we wanted to solve this problem in the first place, because we, we went out and spoke to you know, a couple of hundred companies or something, and we just heard time and time again that people are kind of just doing their own ad hoc authorization from scratch each time. And um, we kind of wanted to address that. And we feel like open source is the best way for that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated that I could find and add this to my Django project. Uh, and I'm the guy who looks for these third party things and adds them almost without question, you know, just to experiment. And so, um, you know, looking at this, I'm, I think you already answered this, but I'm, I'm wondering, oh, it, you know, the money question was good. How are you going to make money? Um, but also, is this a problem? Like, are you solving a problem that exists? Certainly, your your VCs uh, hope that is true, and that you know there's an that there's actually a need for for this. Have you have you experienced some some reward for your efforts? You know, in terms of okay, people really need this. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So typically, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of areas that I see that I see the need for this. Um, I think on one hand, a lot of people who engage with us, I'd say that there's kind of like two main categories of people this like most applies to. Category one is someone who is, you know, maybe getting started or they're at the point where they're like, I, I need to add authorization to my application and I don't have a security background. Like, can you please just tell me like, how, how do I get that done? How do I, how do I make that work? Like, how do I do this in a way that I'm not going to regret it later? And that's why I wanted to share a lot of this stuff today around like, the how to think about roles. Cause I think a lot of people, you start with authorization, you come to roles, you're like, okay, fine, that makes sense. And you add a role field to your user table and then you realize that doesn't get you very far and so on, you have to refactor and so on and so on. So like, I think giving people a way to do it right from the beginning and like without having to think too much about it is like, you know, one, one area. Um, and if that's you, I'd say two things. One is you can join the Slack and come and ask us like, hey, how the hell do I do authorization? Do I need OSO? Yeah. Uh, I also hold weekly office hours to talk about that kind of thing. And I'll try and be pretty uh, vendor neutral in that and just give you the best advice for, for your app. The kind of second class of people, what we see time and time again, as I said, like typically people solve this by just, you know, building up themselves as they need, as and when they go, you know, so they start out, they need like an admin role. So they add a field, which is like, is this person an admin? And then later they're like, well, I need to go more granular, you know, um, and I should say, this is this is more typically in like a B2B kind of application, uh, like a SaaS product, something like that. And they're like, okay, now I need more granularity. And what often happens is people are like, ah, what I have doesn't doesn't work for what I'm trying to do. I need to now like rip out and refactor everything. And they end up with like authorization system number two, and they have like a new set of roles and there's like two systems. And then, um, and there's some pretty prominent examples. Um, like there's a, there's a great blog post from Gusto around how they embarked on a, uh, I don't know where it, where it would be. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but there's a there's a great blog post from Gusto around how they embarked on this sort of like nine to 12 month refactoring project that's like rip out their old authorization and introduce a new system. So that's the kind of second type of people that we're trying to help is like, they reach a point where their current system just can't do anything anymore. They've had enough of these like constant refactoring and pulling things out. Um, because the tough thing with authorization is it like it gets spread throughout an application. It can be very hard to, you know, once you've got a system, to go through and replace all the different number of views that like are, are calling certain things. 
Looks like a few questions in chat, and I did enable hand raising, but it probably maybe it won't work in this particular Zoom. Um, yeah, I yeah. So I'm if I pull up the participants list as well, maybe. Yeah. So if you raise a hand, it should show up here as well. Um, uh, yeah, other environments we support. So okay, so right now from the framework perspective, we're um, primarily looking at Django and Flask as like two. Uh, sorry. Django, Flask, and SQL Alchemy are sort of the, the main like Python frameworks we've been looking at different uh, points. The Flask one, because it's not an ORM um, or anything like that, I'll, I'll come back to later because there's a related question later. Um, the So at, at the moment, the only frameworks we've been uh, sort of directly looking at have been inside Python. Uh, we have sort of like an initial Nest.js one in the Node community as well um, we're building on. Um, but primarily, if, if there is a particular framework or language or combination of those two things that you're interested in using, uh, you can either open a GitHub issue with us. We've got a few going already. Um, for example, like Go is on our near term, very near term roadmap. Um, you can open an issue there or come ask us in Slack. Um, but there'll be more, there'll be more coming soon. But as I said, at the moment, sort of the focus is like uh, sort of Django, SQL Alchemy, things like that. Uh, this seems like more of a comment from Phil, but. Yeah, authorization model is too, uh, could often be too basic. It, yeah, authorization can be, can be really hard to get right. And the, the thing we, 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 you know, speaking personally that we struggle with a lot is, is getting the right balance between uh, like a powerful authorization model, but one that doesn't kind of get in the way of the application. And so the idea that, that we really pushed ourselves on was that um, the policy is just written over your application data as it should be anyway. Like I don't need, you know, in, as I shown in the kind of idea of having like, you know, users inside a category and having roles inside that, those are just like plain old Django models that I write policy over. So then if I need to do things like list all the members in a category, that's not somehow like dependent on my authorization system. A uh, question from Andrew, do you have any way to require an authorized call? Uh, yes. So as I mentioned, there's like a Django middleware. Um, one of the main things that does is you can, you can have like a require authorization middleware that requires you to either explicitly opt out of authorization for a, for a particular route or a particular endpoint, or you must have done authorize somewhere inside the method. Uh, so that's kind of what we have today. The, I think we, we've, had a, we've had a bunch of really great suggestions actually in the Slack from someone pretty engaged in the Django community around things that we could do to be more idiomatically Django, Django-y. Um, so one of them, for example, is you know I think if we you know we could build this as like a mix in for um, for like class based views, I think that would be like a very powerful way just to kind of get it you know put it in sort of everywhere everywhere you can kind of think of. Um, we also have some fun stuff coming up around like being able to try and test like test all of my routes and make sure they have some amount of authorization on them. Oh cool, thanks for the list. Yeah, this is thanks for the linking to the the gusto post. Yeah, actually, you answered my next question, which was that have you, you know, spoken with Django core folks mm -hmm. and, you know, how do they view something like this? Uh, yeah, we also we also had a really, good, really great discussion with someone just just this week around uh, how this compares to a project called Django Guardian. Uh, so Django Guardian is a is a is another Django project that allows that provides you like an API for uh, assigning user permissions and like fetching objects based on those permissions. And so we were kind of talking about like the the interplay between those. Um, I think from the Django in like the Django side of things, there is a couple of there's a couple of things we could do. So you know, Django does have a let me see if I can pull it up. Um, Django does have this kind of um, I think it's just has per has object permission. I don't know. It's a Django REST. Uh, Django does have this kind of framework uh, like interface for. Um, permissions, and actually, for, uh, I keep clicking on the wrong things. Uh, through this, like has perm, which is often I've always really struggled to find this. I think it's through this permission model. One somewhere around here, that um, it's sort of more just like interface. So the yes, this is has perm method. If you use things like Django, Django admin, uh, it will often provide like an implementation for this. So that if you go through the the admin page. Uh, which I think I can actually show. Is this going to let me? No. Maybe I'll stop running the app. 
Oh yeah, it crashed. Uh, so if you do, if you go through like the admin page, it allows you to like specify some permissions, and it'll do some some very coarse grain ones like based on a string. Like you can say, you know, user can add, you know, can add expense, and it'll kind of work here. The so one th one thing that we could do that is provide you know let also be like a backing implementation for this. So that if if you ask it questions like does can the, does the user have you know the create permission on this expense, that it will it will use the sort of native Django uh, interface for answering that question, which means that like any other project which is like relying on that permissions model would just like automatically work with with Oso, which I think would be kind of a nice a nice touch. All right, thank you, Sam. Uh, any more questions? People feel free to chat them or talk. Uh, I assume people can talk in here. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this. I'm gonna hang around till 11:30, and then maybe we'll wrap it if uh, if we're done. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I think this was a much improved second online uh, event. Um, for me, at least, and then I scheduled the next one for to host myself uh, in the January. Hopefully we'll get some volunteers. Oh, we did get two donations. Thank you folks. Um, so, so yeah, um, I'll keep this up for another eight minutes or so. Feel free to drop off or ask questions or uh, do whatever. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, uh, Steffi. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Thanks you, so everyone. I actually kind of have a question for, for you and Andrew, I guess. Um, I guess Andrew inspired me with his kind of meetup questions. So it's, it's been really nice because, you know, we, we want to go out there and, and kind of engage with the community a lot, you know, the Python community and other communities. So it's the sort of online meetup has been sort of convenient for us, but I'm kind of curious from an organizer perspective, um, like, because you're not kind of restricted to location, like, do you still, you know, how, how do you kind of view that? Like, are you trying to expand out to, to you know, broader, broader online communities, or, or you just still commit like regular, you know, reasonably local. Like, how do you think about that? That's a good question. Um, go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so for my groups, it actually. There we go. Uh, so for my groups, it's it's actually been really good. Um, for example, for my book club, we we formerly would meet in like a coffee shop. And so that has to be locals. And now we've had people come in from New Jersey or California. On one occasion, even someone from Poland, where it would have, would have been like three in the morning or something, because you meet in the evenings. Um, so it's actually been really nice for us. Um, we've also, since we're getting less social interaction, I've tried to add like more lightweight things. So, uh, you know, a book club entails you reading a book, which is kind of a big commitment. We also added a movie discussion. Um, the last movie we watched, you may have seen in my examples, was actually the Netflix documentary, uh, Bill Nye Science Guy. And so then and we discussed that for an hour and it was a very good discussion. Um, so I think for me, it's actually been, and my, my tech meetups have seen similar of people drifting in from Chicago who came across it for some reason. So for me, it's actually been pretty good. And I'll, I'll be like a little regretful when, if we go back to physical meetings, but maybe we'll keep like some flag, flagship meeting online. Yeah, I'm not, actually, I'm not going back and I will keep uh, this main monthly meetup online for at least 2021. And I hadn't actually thought of it until you just said it now, you know, that we could market or, you know, solicit attendance from uh, the globe. Uh, because yeah. we could. So, you know, it took me like six months to, you know, first our events dwindle down to nothing. And then I trying to dwindle back up the, the online. Um, I, I think that, that I would be interested in, you know, in global. Um, but I don't know that I would actively pursue it yet. Um, for me, it's um, the DC Python stuff is you know, a personal mission to see events just keep happening in DC. And that's for DC folks, I guess. So um, certainly we have meetup members that are from all over the world. So some of them may attend. Is, any, is there anyone here who isn't, uh, who isn't in DC? I mean, I'm sure that happens quite routinely. Yeah, I'm in New York. <laughs> yeah, well, you don't count, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Point well, point well taken. 
Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll add on to that because um, I help organize the data visualization DC meetup group. And there we've been doing both uh, like sort of social project nights on a monthly basis and webinars. And for the webinars there, we've, you know, we get a lot of people local because that's mostly where we do the communication, but we have had people join from all over the world, including people from South Africa, New Zealand, which has been incredibly cool to see. Um, and the, I think there for the webinars, you know, if, if it's going to be recorded and put on YouTube, then having having it open to everyone, I think makes a lot of sense. So, Will, how how do they do the project nights online? Because I've done those in my tech meetup in person, and I sort of wrote them off for online purposes. Because everyone needs to share screens. You're very vulnerable to Zoom bombing, and I might show my screen to like you know twenty random people. Who... Yeah. So they're how are they working at? They're uh, sort sort of like the sort of like the the uh, DC Python in person project nights went for a lot of people most people don't actually end up working on any projects. Uh, so there it ends up being more, more socialization, more talking shop. Um, usually, usually someone will have an interesting idea for a project or something that they're actually working on um, and people will talk about that. But usually there it's really, the goal is actually the socialization because that's one of the things that's so hard to do is that community building in you know, while well, online virtual. Okay, yeah, that, that's kind of how my my in person project nights went too. is yeah. a lot of entertaining chatting and occasionally helping people with like a technical problem or or how does my IDE work or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I think most importantly for DC Python, at least um, just having the event happen is the main thing you can call it whatever you want. Um, it's nice to have a big presentation. Um, we appreciate you know folks like Sam coming up. But I'm looking for people to, you know, show up and organize the events for the sake of this. And you know, selfishly, it's a lot of work to to pull one of these off. You know, at least for me, um, you know, I got there's the actual work, and then there's the you know the emotional aspect. Like you're thinking, okay, I got to do this Zoom meeting, and you know, everyone's doing Zooms for work. So, you know, it's not a no-brainer to just uh, sit at your computer and you know, click Zoom, not at least for me, not as much as I would like it to be. But I think there's real value, at least for the foreseeable future in in some regular occurrences of this. And so, like I said, you know, anyone wants, that wants to do these on behalf of DC Python, I'll be, you know, talking to folks over the next month or so. And I will uh, show up myself once, once a month. Because they do, you know, they do tend to produce um, interesting uh, discussions and results. So, um, and with that, my dog is, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but my dog's barking. <laughs> so thanks again, all. Um, I'll see everyone in a month or so. Uh, I'll see everyone end of January. Um, take care. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.